So, hi, everybody. <laughs> and I want to address my first question to our guest, Lila. Um, you speak seven languages, you hold three passports, you've lived in so many different places. Where is home for you? Well, hello, first of all, and thank you. Um, I don't deserve all the praise at all, but thank you. I'm very happy to be here in Jerusalem. Uh, I, um, I, I do. I, for, I spent the first 15 years of my life being stateless, which means I had no passport at all. Uh, we had to write stateless in documents. Um, so I also know what it means not to have a passport. So uh, on the other hand, all my passports seem like uh, false papers to me. And I still, when I cross borders, I still feel slightly paranoid when an officer is looking at me. Uh, and, uh, and I don't really feel, I don't really have, uh, I don't feel I have a home. I was brought up in Paris and I love Paris. I love French culture and, it, and, and I'm very grateful to its education. Uh, but I really feel um, there's a, a, a small there's a small creature, uh, which in French is called a Bernard l'ermite, uh, which doesn't have a shell, so it always goes to sleep inside the shell of other animals. <laughs> and, and I would say that I feel quite like a Bernard l'ermite. I feel at home nowhere and everywhere. Excellent. Um, your, your, first no your first book is about Nabokov, another exile uh, immigrant. We're, we're going to discuss the difference between immigrants, exiles, and refugees uh, later. And one of the segments I remember quite vividly from your, the book, which I've also read most recently, uh, is the fact that you say you've uh, visited, you're speaking about yourself because it's essentially an experience <laughs> of reading, and you say you've visited many places, but you always felt that uh, the lost homeland of your parents were somehow a lost golden age, that and everything else seemed just to wane in comparison. Yes, it's true. I think, uh, well, I, I grew up in a funny situation, which is I really grew up with Iranians uh, speaking Persian at home, and but with really most extraordinary people i was very fortunate my mother uh, brought in a lot of people uh, and most of the, most of us most of them had lost uh, everything and they were artists and writers and philosophers uh, sculptors and all they talked about all the time was iran uh, every night and they spoke about cities i hadn't seen and villages i didn't know and mountain tops and um and people and what happened and why the islamic revolution and what had we done uh for this islamic revolution to happen in our country uh, that where my father born in 1930 in tehran remembers 1936 dancing teas accompanying his mother to dancing teas and having women in short skirts sort of dancing 1936 tehran no veils uh women did, did not wear uh, were st stop wearing the veil uh, in the 30s. Uh, so I in fact, what happened is that I, it became a sort of a very strong paradigm for me because I imagined the whole country. Uh, and my father once told me, perhaps you should never go to Iran because you will Sorry, be disappointed. <laughs> it's yeah. and, and I did. I grew up with an imaginary country entirely, entirely. The, streets no, the street names have been changed. The country has been in part, Tehran has become this massive, polluted, I think, huge thing. And, 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 one, and so I think there's a very strong connection between that and the act of writing and, of course, literature. Thank you. I, I, I have to throw this straight back at you, Dorit, I, I, because... I it's can see why. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, so it two qu I'm going to ask two questions. You I, can I, every <laughs> question you're going to uh, suggest, the answer would be the same as Lila's. <laughs> I mean, it's just uh, yes. unbelievably Similar. resembles the, the experience of Jews immigrating from Iran to Israel and keep on longing back to their homeland and speaking about it so passionately and always with their eyes shut as if they cannot bear the reality in order to uh, recall the memories and for an Israeli kid I would have listened to their memories being told in Hebrew and maybe had the, their longings sinked in me writing my first novel was exactly. imagining what they have seen under their uh, eyelids. Yeah, and that's and why I would imagine your eyes, or at least your inner eyes, would have been very much open when you've imagined places that, or that you've never been to and, and conjured a longing to a place that you've never been to. Yes, and for, for me, it was book. never concrete, as you mentioned, because uh, my parents, they were young when they immigrated, and my, my grandparents, uh, they, they came from the Jewish ghetto within the, the major cities of uh, Isfahan and Tehran. And I, I think that for them, it wasn't as 
concrete that may be for, uh, so, so, uh, for, for Iranians who are not a minority within the society. Um, so, but I must take it, sorry, to, to be, to be uh, very, I, I am worried about, may, uh, let's say that my first novel was more to do with the Persia, with the imaginary, fictionary Persia and those distant, maybe 1001 Arabian Nights kind of uh, glorious memories uh, or, or territories. Uh, I, I read, I read uh, a few years ago a reportage of exiles who had moved, maybe like your family, from the political current Iran after the revolution and their experience. And the time before the revolution had broke and how they could not sense that it's about to change their life and to be, to be so dramatically um, restaged the whole reality in Iran. And, and for me, ever since I read this text, I keep on walking through the Israeli streets and Israeli reality news and keep on wondering, are we facing Maybe okay. I, some I thought we were going to get to this. Did I, the I, end, I, I'm, I'm, I had such a political year. I cannot look at anything and not see politics well, in everything. Everything is in political. Every, anyway. Everything had become political, even okay. if maybe I'm just I was naive. I'm just quickly bounce back and, and, and in order to let Shimon talk. But I, I, I just I want to say I, I also feel that way. I think it's part of our collective trauma, and I relate to it very much. In fact, so much so that all my life I've always thought, okay, well. What if this explodes right now? What am I going to do? Uh, what's my plan B, C, and D for a career? Uh, I, I might be a, a terrible cabaret singer, or I'll, I'll be a tour guide, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, and and so no, I know exactly what you mean. I think th yes. We, we, well, we are unfortunately live with kind of an ingrained perpetual refugee I mentality. I thought being so, so, so in such anxiety, it's, it's uh -huh. the destiny of Israelis. But I can see <laughs> you. <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to ask you, Shimon. Uh, start starting with. Uh, well, the fabled town you hail from, which has now become a subject, you know, it's your poems about the art is now being, are being taught in, uh, in school systems and eulogized, but it seems to me that it's a fictionalized town for you and in your writing in as much as, 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 um, as your more fantastic places are fictional. Well, I think you're right, but uh, first, do it. You had the great honor to be banned from the educational systems. <laughs> I wish I would. He wish he was, be he banned, was banned someday. Too. <laughs> you know? I'm not. I'm it not. Result in a surge. I'm not controversial sales. enough. You're, you're, you're going to be remembered uh, for your talent. I'm sorry. Yeah, I yeah. can't avoid no, but, this. But it's. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, Anyway, uh, for me, the experience is kind of different from both of you because my parents came from Morocco when they were children. And for them, the, um, the it, it was a different experience for my father and for my mother. But the the, uh, um, the similar uh, similarity between their experience was the the kind the uh, coming to Israel was kind of a, uh, they had a break in a way. There is something in the continuity of their life was broken, and it was also. Uh, um, it, it also was a gap within uh, their inner self. In a way, the, the, the part of the people that they left in Morocco were uh, parts that could not be spoken anymore. And in a way, they could not, could not tell their stories. Uh, my mother came when she was 12, and for her, it was also growing up, you know, becoming, for her, 12 was the, the age in, in, in which she became a woman. And coming to Israel was also becoming a woman. So she also, she, al she also left her childhood behind. And her childhood is kind of a mute story. Whenever I tried, it wasn't the, as if we didn't want to listen as children like me and my brothers. It, they, they, they never spoke about it in a way. They couldn't bring themselves to tell the story about their place of origin. So for me, uh, Morocco first is kind of um, dark, uh, Vista. There is nothing there. Yeah, I see. My, my, my father's hometown is called the White City because really? it's white, but I cannot see the whiteness there. I on, so. only see like the evening going down or, or just uh, the sun falling on, on the city. So, uh, so for me, the, there is no part of uh, longing to, to, uh, to another place. Okay. 
So, uh, and, and my parents, because they came from Morocco, they couldn't really belong. So they were in a state of continue, continuing longing to the place in which they were. So there was always this kind of gap between the place, the physical place, and the place that they were supposed to come to and never got to. Uh, so every place became already a representation of another place for them. It seems and, to me. And it was, yeah, excuse sorry. me, yes. No, it's, it seems to me the hallmark of all of your characters, what you're just describing in, now. In, 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 a way, in, a, in a way, yeah, in a way, it's, it's, it's the structure of, 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 of my fiction. There is always a physical place on which another place is already being forced. And it's a product of imagination because you long to this place, it doesn't exist, it's not part of your experience. But there is another, an, another facet to it, because another aspect. Because um, my father was a very religious person, so we used to study text together. So this, my first home is a text. But, but an, anyway, the, the text, mostly Jewish, um, um, Jewish um, sacred Jewish texts. And, and there is something strange about Israel, because Israel, there is another map of Israel, which you can find in the Bible, and you can find in the Mishnah, and you can find in the, in the Talmud. And every place has this kind of aura, because it's so ancient. And you go, you go to Be'er Sheva, but Be'er Sheva is also a place where Abraham lived. And you come to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is full of mythology. So, so for, for my father, Israel was oh, first um, a myth mythological country in which no mythology could exist because the physical didn't really match the mythology. So for me, it's, it's all about being in this gap, stepping you know, from both sides of the cup, from the physical place to the imaginary place. Well, I'm getting better inside both of your um, um, sci-fi fiction and the regular one, but uh, <laughs> um, I, I want to throw this back at, uh, at you, Lila, because you said uh, language is uh, I, I don't exactly remember how you said it, but language is your place, your natural place. And I want to think of uh, Heidegger's famous words that language is the home of being. And poetry, and I think. Yeah, yeah poet it's, poet it's a dichtung. It's a kind of sp poetic kind of language. Uh, and um, I think this is, in a way, what Shimon was trying to say for, for you, maybe, that this is your, your place of being. And is it true for you? Do you think this is a place for, for a writer? Yes, of course, and I mean, in, in a very prosaic way, I mean, I, I always get embarrassed when people uh, mention the fact that I speak languages, but I think a part of it comes from a place of, of insecurity and of longing to fit in. I always wanted to fit in, so I always want to, I always want to deconstruct a language, reconstruct it like, like a puzzle, and tell the other, you know, it's, it's okay, we speak the same language, now we can, now we can talk, we can, we, what we were talking about at the last panel, and look at them in the eyes. But I want to come back, and, and for sure, and so language and writing, both both speaking and writing has become this perpetual bridge that I'm that I try to build, and and also it's a way to this longing also is a longing to belong. Uh, so you always um, trying to master language is always trying to belong. But in my case, I write in English, which um, is 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 a language I learned late, and I can never fully master. So there's always a level of insecurity also built into my English, and I'm very fortunate that I met wonderful editors and people who actually like the fact that there's a foreignness that in, I introduce, there's an, like an, an unfamiliarity that I introduce in the English language. But to bounce back quickly on what you said, it really, really speaks to me. And I think actually the way you defined um, even your experience of Israel, to me, with, between mythology and something that is superimposed upon it and that just doesn't fit, I think really is a def definition of literature. I think that's what Joyce does in Ulysses. You know, if you, what I love so much about Ulysses is exactly that, is that he chooses to foreground this it, he calls it Ul Ulysses, and then it's Dublin, and what's extraordinary is that he's talking about being in the library at St. Genevieve, and, over, over, and then he says, the scales of the dragon, the dragon was moving in me, her, her golden scales, you know, and he sees the season, there's something else, and it's never quite that, but that's what gives it its depth, and then the discrepancy between the mythological echo that's there but already lost, and what he's trying to grasp of it again is the space of literature. Uh, do it. I'm gonna bounce this back to you quickly. Uh, <laughs> is 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 writing uh, an ex-territorial experience to you? Do you always have to be outside of a place in a way, or 
a spiritual exile, maybe, of sorts? I think we're doomed. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not a matter of choice and it's not a matter of uh, will. And the, the most us in Israel, or uh, us no, as us, as writers, it's, okay. it's don't be so giddy about it. <laughs> <laughs> we're doomed. So giddy, yeah. No, we're, we're not. We're not doomed. I disagree. <laughs> it's 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 just it's just a, a being uh, being assimilated is something that no, not not politically, not uh, with the whole thing. Assimilation has become a dangerous uh, term. Um, just trying to fit in to be long it's it's uh it's always a matter of uh, uh, it's on the verge of happening never happening never uh really fits in and you have to have your uh distance to write you have to have your uh inner um maybe kingdom or quindom if there's such a word um i like it you like it. it it happened to me well at the time i lived in new york i came up with all those strange uh, uh concocted words, words yeah. that they were saying it's nice but there's no such word in english <laughs> <laughs> but um this is maybe the uh, another example of being an immigrant but i think that while i was writing while i'm writing any novel i'm experiencing not only an imaginary imaginary city it's a maybe an imaginary self or or trying to adopt a part of me that is not explored in real life and try to live it up through the story and, and I, i'm thinking about in in your last novel there is a description of tel aviv in the spring which we've just experience anyone who's been in Tel Aviv in the spring and and it just crossed my mind it is almost as uh, imaginary and fictionalized as the way you describe places you've never been to <laughs> so wh wh where is where does r reality fit in I, th I think it's the um, um, the point of view of a tourist that maybe your father was an internal tourist in Israel that he experienced uh, Be'er Sheva in a in a mythological glorified way that uh, the a everyday life in Be'er Sheva is, is so concrete and so common and so uh, Israel today that uh, being out coming from uh, overseas back to your home you you you're being uh, benefit with few days of seeing your own immediate home in new eyes in some perspective that is new uh, it, it may be tragic when you when you go through kind of point of view for years and years and having generations that <laughs> observe this kind of uh, foreignerness to the immediate foreignness. Yes, being being l'étranger. Uh, so so for you, Shimon, it's, it's, it's true. You you have this double um, um, uh, liminality of source because there is uh, the ingrained exile that uh, is the hallmark and the heavy burden that of Jewishness that you somehow have to bear because of your affinity with the texts and then the the, the experience of immigration which is different very different and and we, we very quickly I'm gonna say that exile I don't know to, to me at least conjures up uh, exotic things like uh, rene renegade Greek philosophers and Romans and white Russians and it's not exactly the same. When it's well sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> when it's we well sponsored then exile can be very very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> the, the whole, the whole uh, yes. tragic uh, content of exile when it's, not, when it's due to to be to, to be for to being priv from yeah. coming from a privileged place, but I think in the in Jewish experience or for you, exile is a very different thing. Can you say a little bit about it? Yeah, first I, I, I'd like to point out to the, there is a difference between the um, the religious or metaphysical sense of exile and the political or geographical geopolitical uh, meaning of uh, of exile, which you, that they don't coincide, especially in the Israeli uh, context. Uh, first, for, for, for many generations, it's a well-known fact that, that Judaism really moved or the, uh, um, the way of thinking of the, um, the pattern of thought kind of uh, oscillated between exile and redemption, yeah, not exiled and homeland. It's not so. It wasn't 
as it, it wasn't it, it, did, it didn't have to do anything with territory. Territory came afterwards, but first people had to be redeemed, and it's supposed to be uh, divine intervention. Intervention. It's supposed to be uh, brought upon the people. People couldn't do anything. The Jewish people couldn't do anything except, you know, in certain uh, certain parts of Judaism, in which they could have adapted their life in order to bring forth the redemption or the what's called geula, the salvation, by by doing uh, by, by by abiding the law in in a way, the Jewish law, it's doing or what's called the um, um, making themselves better people, according according to to Jewish uh, to, uh, to the way Jewish uh, law so what, uh, uh, held what a person should should uh, should be like, and and uh, and and you know the the political sense of of uh, of exile in Israeli thought, which is kind of the in, in the nationalistic uh, interpretation of exile, it's opposed to homeland. So once you get a territory, then you're not in exile. When, when, when I turn back to my father's experience, which I think it's ingrained in me, and in a way it's, uh, it's also part of my, or my, my way of thinking of, of the world, then, then there is this, he, he was, wasn't in exile anymore because he was part of a sovereign population in Israel, but for him, it was, he was still in exile because he wasn't, he wasn't, uh, re, he, he hadn't been redeemed. Part of also yeah. the predominant culture, yeah. or yeah. is that have anything and, to do and, with and, it? And yeah, and for him, it was kind of uh, in order to be part of the uh, of the of the Israeli uh, way of life. The price was he had to pay was to to discard his religious uh, belief. So there is a, there was the, 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 there is also another gap. Another the, the gap is really being expressed through the the. the um, uh, divide between the religious and the political. Uh, so, so um, for me, I can I cannot say that I'm in exile, or I don't, or I really know what what being in, in being in exile means. But I know what that what what it means to be a stranger within your your home, with your what what you call homeland, and this feeling of discomfort that you don't really fit, and there is this. Human tendency, which is being, I think, worked into literature. The, w the way it, in, 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 the, the way, the way uh, Lila said, uh, in a way that we are never. I'm just taking your words. Uh, just, just I'm, I'm, I'm putting words into what you said. I'm not going to to rephrase what you said. Just, just the way of. Uh, so, so we, we take we take human uh, basic human tendencies and and we make them into construct of stories, and and there is the human this human tendency never to be satisfied with what you get. So you want to belong, and once you belong, you want not to belong. You know, you want you want to be in the state of longing, but, but and of once and once you are in a state of longing, you want again to to, to fit in. It's and just like love. Yeah, yeah, and once exactly, just exactly. Uh, everyone, you know, each one and his uh, associations. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't call it love, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> to each his I own. What's called, yeah. So so, <laughs> so, so 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 this this also had this yeah. kind of dynamic in which you fit in when, when you. you you don't master language. Never. You never master language. Never. Even even if you are a native speaker of language, you have you have areas or territories of language in which you you could explore further. But once you get to a level of of uh, of mastering part of the language, then in a way you want to unlearn this experience in order to write true literature. Completely, I agree, and I have that experience in French, which is the language that I think I s perhaps speak best orally, and it's a language in which I have a French melody in, in all my languages. But the funny thing is, I am an unfamiliar person, I'm a stranger to my own French, because often I, I speak French, and I hear myself speaking French, and I think, oh, I sound very native, I sound just <laughs> like a French person, and this happens to me very often, which makes me feel, again, exactly Exactly, exactly what you said. I always feel like double, doubled up, and I'm and I'm thinking, well, w wait a minute. That's that's almost what the Germans call unheimlich, you know, like yeah. unfamiliarity yeah. in in the language. And to go back to what you were saying about the Jewish experience, I think. Um, 
many years ago with uh, a friend of mine who, who now uh, is, is the artistic director of the festival. We were sitting in New York in Central Park having a sandwich and we were talking about American friends and non-American friends and we were, saying, we were saying sometimes it's difficult to make American friends and I said, but I have many American friends and she said, Lila, all your friends are Jewish, what are you talking about? <laughs> and and uh, which, which, which was funny and I realized she knew all of them and I realized immediately and I knew that and I've known that for many reasons and for reasons pertaining to my family's history also so that part of the reason why is that to me, I think, as a double exile, both from Iran and also from Europe, um, there was something about, say, uh, uh, the, the common American experience that was a little bit foreign to me. There was a degree of cultural shock that I didn't really relate to it, to someone you know, um, uh, just not knowing what was behind tw 20 years behind them. But there is something, of course, in the Jewish experience and what you said about exile and l redemption or the lack thereof that spoke deeply deeply to who we are and even who we are as Iranians. And there are deep connections that I've often talked about and written about between the Jewish experience and the, and the in Iranian history as well, and our peoples, in fact. And that obviously relates to uh, your fascination with Nabokov's... And uh, also Joyce. <laughs> Of course, it, absolutely. And, and with America and with foreigners and with being an exactly. exile. Exactly. And Nabokov, very similar. Nabokov was married to a Jewish woman. Uh, he Fair. came from a family where in, in the middle you know, of uh, pogroms going on in, the, in, in, the for in Russia, uh, his family, in fact, his father uh, uh, spoke out against pogroms. His grandfather did too. And, and when they went into exile, they also went into multiple exiles because his wife was Jewish, because his son was Jewish, because of the Bolshevik revolution. And he said exile was a sink kick he would not have missed for world. <laughs> There's something between uh, a, a link or a bond between Iranian ladies and the book of have you know have you uh, noticed yes, we discussed it on the way. <laughs> yes, I was reading, reading Lolita in Tehran. I thought it was caviar, Iranian and Russian caviar, <laughs> but it must be something else. Uh, but I want to ask you, Doid, because we, we brought up the subject of language and um, the, the ethereal and the earthly, and many reviews, even early on about your, your work, it always accentuated the, the sensuality or the sensational sensuality of your writing, the sense, the colors. Uh, would you say that that is uh, tainted from your Persian heritage or... or or is there any bearing on your language, on your Hebrew, from your ancestry? Could be, <laughs> and at the same time, could be the books I read. I, I can't, uh, yeah, it, it's maybe it's um, who we are as, uh, may, and, I, and everything that, we, uh, that I say, who I am and who we are, I can, I can refer hmm. to, so many communities in so many maybe it's who we are Israelis who we are Jews who we are as uh, as a, a, a expersions and uh, I don't know yeah I grew up in an Israeli country reading European books so my my language of writing was shaped um, with <coughs> the the lullabies of Persian immigrants that I heard and with Nabokov with Thomas Mann and the greatest uh, novelists from Europe that I read. So it could be a mixture. Okay, so, so to further uh, sink in to um, that uh, flowery uh, Hebrew of yours, um, I, wanted, I wanna take that and move into the subject of borders and boundaries. Your last book, uh, uh, remind me the name in English, it's called Border Life. Border Life, Border Life. Uh, is about borders, about boundaries uh, between uh, people, uh, nationalities, and states. And somehow it seems to me that uh, your project in this novel and as a writer is to dissipate. Dissipate? Dissipate, to melt, to, to, uh, melt down. Maybe as a wish, boundaries. but uh, the vista, the, maybe the educational, cultural landscape that we carry overseas and when we mix with other languages, other cultures, is always uh, maybe more uh, strongly, maybe more demandingly printed in, in who we are, more th maybe more than we wanna, wanna have, to be so shaped and so designed by these forces that our wish to melt in or belong or, or Maybe, um, yeah, like you, w like this verb that you used. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, 
because I'm, I'm, I very vividly remember the last uh, few dozen pages, maybe, of, of, of your novel, where, where um, language itself, with imagery of um, water, mainly, and I think that's true for all of your books, there's always somehow uh, watery elements that uh, in, in invariably fuse people together, be it tears, or the sea, or sweat, or some kind of watery element that, that invariably just um, topples down the borders and the language itself just shines out and, and covers everything with uh, Thank you. I, uh, thank wonders. you. I, <laughs> I, 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 I take it that um, the, 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 the tragic solution of having these two characters uh, share the same Union location uh, at the end of the book is, is underwater, is, uh, is, is a fantasy. Um, uh, this uh, may be a very twisted, tragic, binational state that I allow them to share at these moments of... Uh, Im imaginary binational state, yeah. if we want to be true to our topic. Yeah, imaginary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, people were, weren't so... Uh, I mean, um, people expect some sort of a happy ending, them to unify and live happily ever after. But uh, I, I think borders and boundaries are so much more rooted with our universal free spirits than we, than we want to admit, than we wish to take responsibility for. And, uh, and, 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 and I'm, I'm letting them mix but I'm letting those conflicts that they carry within them, because they carry the conflict within them, they're not truly free, and they're not um, emancipated through this free land of New York, of English, of intellectual consciousness. They still who they were and who they are and who they will be. Um, Saying it to, no. to to you being such a universal <laughs> spirit, <laughs> uh. I I I, uh, I feel I feel so provincial, and this is my project, the the provinciality within us, and how how this uh, ambivalency of being, uh, maybe with multi cultures and multi personalities, due to all these cultures that we we were fed with, uh, we're very much. Um, limited to who and where. There's a phrase, beautiful phrase in Hebrew that the, the a, a, a cast of your um, primordial the way we landscape. We're molded yeah. by the human landscape that we are raised in. So, so t two things here. First off, I'm thinking she went about, about the your hybrid creatures and that kind of uh, construct of uh, of many selves being fused together, uh, primarily in your science fiction writing or fantasy or fantasy writing. Can you say something about that in terms of borders or stepping out mm -hmm. of boundaries? Uh, first, it's a basic cognitive fact that we need some kind of confinement in order to recognize the world. We need some kind of categories. We need some kind of uh, yeah. m uh, mean of organizing the world, so, so all our sensual data in order to experience anything at all. And uh, so, so in a way, we need borders. We need, but, but it's one question whether we need, we need them or, or, or we don't. It's another question how they express in reality. And, and etymologically, as you pointed out earlier, mm. uh, the word borders in Hebrew, as in the title of your last novel, also means in Hebrew definition. Definition, yeah. Gadil, it's, 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 it's the same root. It's the same yeah. root. Uh, and and th so the question what you do with border, how do you undermine existing borders, and how do you... Uh, make borders into, or, or you, you you make holes within borders so you can move to the other side or let things from the other side move towards you. So as as Dorit said, we are oh, we are kind of, a, and we live in this kind of era in which we really believe that we are product of our own experience in the world, our our biography, our our um, uh, our background, and 
the books, the books we read, the, the, the song we listened to when we were growing up. And I'm, I'm not, I don't think that it's necessarily so, because I, ha I know that there is part of us that already, is already experiencing another reality all the time. And the question is whether we can, uh, within writing, open some windows to these other realities that we experience, and sometimes it, it, uh, you, we, can, we can touch touch it within the mundane experience you know for me for me it's you know I'm going I'm, I'm walking in the street and suddenly I see a man holding his head under his uh, you know armpit and it's just for one moment and then and then okay. things that I've seen you know uh, things that that were you know appeared in my dreams are, um, are shaping to be reality in in, in that's one point of my experience. It's, it's so, 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 in a way, I'm I'm not trying to to make it into kind. Of, I I don't have any mystical argument here. I'm I'm saying that's the way things are. No, but and I, and, and and I think and I think this this notion of hybridity or hybridity uh -huh. is first. So we are we are defined by our experience, but our experience is random. There is nothing essential to our experience. Because we could, we, we, we read one book, we could have read, read another oh. book completely, right. and we, we could be a different person, uh, different people every minute of our, of our existence. So, so for me, it's always trying to explore this different per person I could have been mm -hmm. had I had this kind of experience. And, and in order to do this, I'm trying to think as myself, as this kind of, uh, it's, it's really, it's also banal because Rambo already said that, you know, when he said, I'm the other. So, so you may so, not so, have... Um, so, so, yeah. so in a way that I'm letting just, you know, I'm trying to find uh, literary uh, vehicles in mm -hmm. order to allow this experience to be expressed of belonging not to one world, but to many worlds at the same so, time. So you may not have a, a, a mystical argument, but uh, the corpus of your work certainly suggests a, myst a mystical project of sorts, because it would seem like you attempt to conjure or charter ways and paths and s ever more circuitous ways to another world that is possible, that is better than this one, that is an elsewhere. I, I, mean, I, I don't know that it's better. I know, th uh, I know that it's different. And the more it's different, the more I'm fascinated by it. In a way that um, uh, reality is not predestined. We have a choice. We do have free will. But this free will is, or we also, also submitting this free will to all these kind of confinements that we adopt unconsciously. And, and I think that literature, literature sometimes can help us reconsider our choices of confinements. So this brings me to your uh, literature and its, well, breach of confinements, I would say, because uh, I told you on, in our brief conversation today that as Nabokov said that Lolita was his love affair with language, to me, your last novel, your novel is very much a love affair with the experience of reading. And I, for one, as a reader, felt for the first time heralded that unsung, lonesome, dark, quiet task of reading is suddenly celebrated in a book. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that brings us to the topic of borders because reader and writer uh, fuse their bodies very much like in Doit's book. Uh, their bodies, yours and Nabokov's, but also the book he wrote and the reader who is myself, who is reading that fusion at all, uh, melts together with those vibrant... Sounds very erotic, I must It uh, is, we add. were discussing that I too. And, <laughs> and, and I told you today also that there is always a, 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 there's always something somatic and corporal about <coughs> reading a, a taint of a suntan lotion left on the page, curled toes. There's always something uh, of, of the body to do with the experience of reading, which is very different from the spiritual exile we spoke of earlier. I so. Y yes, I agree. I, I think it is an erotic experience, and I'm very. I've always been interested in spaces of transgression, both being 
uh, I realized I went I went to Catholic school as a child and I didn't I, my parents never talked about religion so I didn't realize that I wasn't exactly Catholic I didn't know what I was <laughs> until I was nine years old and the and the sisters came to me and said it was the time to do your communion and I they came up to me and they said well you can't do your communion and I said well why not I, f I felt like I was a devout Catholic <laughs> and uh, and in fact we had to get up in church and say our names with the saints and I got up and said Saint Lila and although I was nine I felt that something sounded a little off with Saint Lila, but I wasn't sure what <laughs> until until I was told that I wasn't allowed. So I went to the, my mother, who's a real character and, and this extraordinary woman, went to the school and I remember sitting there and she told the director of the school, if Jesus in person were coming back here, he would let this child do her communion. <laughs> and they didn't let me, they wouldn't even baptize me. So that was my first clash with identity and it was it was quite violent and it was, tra it was traumatic in, in, in some ways, but but um, but I realized many years later I was I was offered b for another reason um, to uh, to be baptized, and this was a few years ago. And and although I have a strong faith, I, I don't feel I belong to any religion. But I've always felt more as a friend of mine says more Judeo Christian. I really did. I told I, I this was a, a priest from the, a remote region of South America who was telling me, I'll baptize you. And I'll say, you know, and I told him, I'm going to tell you something very shocking. Um, and I'm sure you won't understand it, but I have to be honest with you. I, um, I feel this in my heart, but I don't want to be baptized. Um, and, and I don't want to belong to a, to a system. I don't want, so I don't want to belong to an institution. I, I feel fine on the border. And um, so that very much connects with the theme. I think that's what I feel about nationality. It's very difficult for me to define my nationality. Um, I don't really have one. I, I feel very Iranian in many ways. I've become very European. Also, after 16 years, I've also become American in other ways. Uh, I, I, and it's the same thing. Um, it's very much the same thing with religion. Uh, I um, I don't feel I belong, and I feel I belong to all three, and, and maybe a few others. Uh, but I uh, I and 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 so so there's a connection with always being on the border. I always feel that my place is being on the border, uh, at the border. And uh, but then you have to open spaces of transgression. If I step into a church or in a synagogue, I know I'll always be seen as a as a foreigner. Uh, but that's okay. I've learned that my identity is to be also the transgressor, but in, in as respectful a way as possible and sort of embracing the places where I am with, with my heart. And I think there's, to me, so there's the trans, the transgressive is, is erotic in a way because you're always, there's a space of friction. There's a space where you're also, you're trying to find your place. You're trying to, you're trying to, um, there's a space of seduction, I would I would say also. There's a space of um, of um, for you're 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 always real, you know you're lo always looking at yourself and the other also as in as you you feel your otherness. You're never quite one with the other. So all that is very connected to eroticism. But coming back to your part, to what you were saying, I do feel, in spite of the fact that there's a physical, a transgressive dimension. I do feel like I, there's. I'm very interested in the mystical project, and I think I think that that and uh, even for a, a person, and again for a, a writer like Nabokov, who wasn't religious at all, he there's a deep mystical undercurrent in his in his work, and he says at one point that it's when he's catching butterflies uh, amongst butterflies and their food food plants that he feels um, a certain oneness with sun and stone, a thrill of gratitude to whom it may concern. And, 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 and he says something that, that, it, it, that I thought of when you were speaking about, about your, the way you, you uh, sometimes you have access to another reality. It happens to me all the time as well. I think I live for those moments. Uh, and, and, and he was saying that we live in a house and sometimes you know we're, we're all sur we're surrounded by windows all the time. Sometimes, very rarely, the door opens and there's a there's a sigh and a so coming. But really, uh, we're this other world surrounds us always. And I think our task, being at the border, being writers, is to catch those moments. And uh, and we may call them mystical or not, but for me they are very very much. And I think when I'm at my best place in my writing, I try to open those windows. You certainly weaved your net for Nabokov in the in your book, and and sometimes you almost seem to consume him because there's a paragraph by him, and it just 
uh, dissolves into your writing. That, into that's right. I, I, I did actually. I thought it was important also as a woman. He didn't like woman writers very much. He was no. very old school. No, no. That's true. and and he he called them lady writers. He only lady he writers. only he only tolerated Jane Austen, and he called her right. Jane. So of course, in my last chapter, I I I, can I did consume him. I used his words, I, I, and I reconstructed a whole other world, thinking you know now I'm taking over. He would have loved you. <laughs> I think so. I think so too. Um, um, I, I'm thinking I'm going to just revert back to Nabokov because I remember I don't remember if it's in Speak Memory or elsewhere that he says, uh, or, or in maybe in an interview, someone asked him, "Why do you live in a hotel?" And he said, "Unless it's a, uh, an accurate construction of my childhood home, I don't want anything else. I don't want to live in another house." Okay. And and uh, it's actually an, an identical question to to all of you. Um, is I want to hear them first. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I, I want to ask you. Okay, I'll ask you, Shimon, because uh, okay. it's a uh, it's it pertains to your uh, writing in particular because I'm thinking uh, we're living here uh, in Israel. Jews are not that dealing that good with territories, as you mentioned earlier. But here we are, nevertheless each under her vine and her fig. Uh, <laughs> but if it's not exactly that same vine and that fig, that same fig, does it have to be imagined? Um, <laughs> first, yes. As if a it's hotel, not, are we in a hotel not, of sorts? It's not, if, if it's not <laughs> I exactly the same, then it's imagined. It's, it's, it's removed from reality, then it's, that's, then it's Im imagined by definition. But um, I don't have... You know, sometimes when uh, I'm continuing the uh, the theme of dreaming and letting other other reality c crawl into your own experience of the world, so um, sometimes I I you know I grew up I, I grew up in a very big family, and and whenever a child was born, then we my parents were uh, renting from the. Uh, uh, from a housing company, which was was a national housing company, and whenever a, a new a new child was born, then they would send people, mostly Palestinian, by the way. It was very oh. interesting during the 80s to really? to see my 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 mother, especially speaking with Palestinians. But but they use uh, and they would um, they they would change the structure of the house. They would add a room. They would add another bathroom and and so the, the the house kept changing so for me there was no form to the house it was fluid all the time and i was moved moved between rooms sometimes i slept with another brother sometimes i was by by my own so it, also the notion of privacy and not not having privacy it wasn't part of the the experience of my of of, of growing up in in a home so so um so for me in a way um uh, the experience of home became kind of uh, um, incorporeal. Mm -hmm. it, it's a notion. It's for me, it's the food of my mother, which whenever I eat it, I feel at home. But but also, I started to think about myself as a creature that lives within time and not within space. So uh, in a way, for me, being at home is is having is ha is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. In, in, in a way, in a way, you know, my my uh, my. If I had to choose a home, then for me it would be this this uh, police box in which the TARDIS, in which Doctor Who is traveling throughout time. Okay. For me, this okay. would be a perfect home. Where Where is home for you, do it? It's uh, 18 Haigoz Street in Farsaba. Okay. <laughs> this is where <laughs> my, uh, my I, I was uh, raised and uh, where I I was brought from uh, from the hospital too. And this is what I consider to be home. All uh, in the past, uh, let's say uh, 20 years. I have uh, uh, moved from uh, 17 rented apartments, so maybe it's a good... Uh, Almost like Dostoevsky, he moved 27 <laughs> times in St. Petersburg wow. to have a different angle of the city all the time because he thought it improved his writing, so... <laughs> well, well done! This wasn't the reason! <laughs> <laughs> I don't... <laughs> I would have... I, I, I would have... 
prefer to be uh, 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 not as good as Dostoevsky <laughs> but, and lived in a, in a common ground uh, for longer. It's just that Tel Aviv had become such a, an expensive city to live in and um, I have to move apartments. So, so but as, as you pointed out earlier in, in your no last novel, uh, your character, the Palestinian and Israeli Khumi and Liat, they meet in, a, in New York, uh, which is not neither their hometowns, but do you feel somehow Khilmi has more of a connection with the earth, with the substantial placidness of this country than his uh, Israeli counterpart in the book? It's interesting that you say that. It's, um, it's ever since the controversy, ever since the scandal, I, I became uh, a very... An advocate I, I, or a spokesperson. No, 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 no. I, 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 I am surprised myself. I became a, a very popular within the settlements. Really? They read my novel and they write me <laughs> letters and the they... Enemies. And they very... And the enemies. Yeah, it's 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 uh, they, they they tell me I had to wait a long time in the library until your novel was was returned back and I could borrow it and I and they all repeat on saying an element from the novel which is when Khilmi goes back to the West Bank he rents a, a house in a, in a small village in the north of Ramallah which is called Jifna. 20 minutes from now, from here. Uh, time and space, you confused me. Um, and they all write me. It, w it was I unbelievable. Uh, in their um, letters, it's always mentioned that Jifna is mentioned in Pirkei Avot, which is uh, our, uh, I don't know, wha wha what's the ref ethics of the fathers, thank you. And it, they, Jifna is, uh, is named there Gofna. And it takes place at the very same spot in the what is now north of Ramallah. And they say, you should know that Jifna is ours too. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> no. <laughs> so Khilmi's <that laughs> so connection to the ground uh, is done from literary, uh, maybe sentimental reasons, non-political. Uh, I, I, I thought it would be uh, fair to have him return back to his homeland and be friends with the ground, with the soil, uh, because he's about to lose his life within the waters Literally. of this land that he could never reach. This has a, a very strong political echo, the fact that he could never reach the horizon, the sea, the part of this, what, he, what his native homeland to be. But uh, the, 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 the garden that he flourishes, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's from uh, sentimental matters, less than political. Okay, so, so back to this controversy and speaking of borders, I assume that during the last year you've had to speak out in the world very often about this, about the controversy, about your book being banned. Uh, how did that go for you? <laughs> I mean, how did you feel about representing what's going on here at this time and place? Whether you're a creature of time or, or, or place. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 to be honest, I have to defend Israel as I used to do earlier. It's just that now my interviewers and my readers, they, they come across with uh, more worry to the Israeli uh, democracy democracy and I have to say that my book is also not only a, a symbol of where Israel is heading to and is how but also to how strong and fundamental the freedom of speech is rooted within the society within the within the culture and that the the the, the banning the the scandal aroused this huge march of Israelis supporting me in my book uh, as a symbol of there is no way that the, 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 the nation of book, of the book of books, would be be recognized with banning books. So I'm I'm very much uh, became an ambassador <laughs> of Israeli uh, liberalism, okay. maybe. So, uh, Shimon, you also have banned poetry in in uh, one of your novels. 
that makes uh, people transmogrify into um, all kinds of alien beings. But uh, uh, I, I want to ask you about being an ambassador for Israel as well. And in your last book, which is possibly the most flagrantly political of your books, which it, because it's about the last war in Gaza, uh, the writer, the character of the writer, ha actually has to go to conferences in the world and defend Israel. Is that something that is real for you? or? It was real. In, in a way, I was trying to, I was so really overwhelmed by what was happening in 2014 uh, that I, in a, uh, the, the novel I wrote was trying to document what was happening, but in a fictional tools, with, with using fictional um, uh, tools. And uh, so for, there, there is, I, I came back to a character that I kind of abandoned. It was the character of my first novel, and just wrote 12, 12 years afterwards what's going on with this character. And this character has a family in store, the way I, the, and, and it started when, the war started when I was in France, and, and I was in a festival there. And it was so hard to be there because uh, probably Dorit know this feeling in a way that you are uh, you 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 agree with some of the argument against Israel and about about the Israel of the Israeli policy, but in a way you feel this undercurrents undercurrents of anti-Semitism, in which that you are condemned for being Jew. It's it's kind. It's not. It doesn't have to do with the political. Uh, with the political uh, situation right now. It just enables this kind of um, burst of anti-Semitism. And, and it, 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 it really picked when I was in, uh, I was reading from my poetry, and then there was a woman uh, who came to the event and she called out uh, the state of Israel should be demolished. It doesn't have any rights to to uh, to exist anymore. And the only thing I could, uh, could have said was, you know, uh, I don't. I didn't know that it, it's the decision of French uh, citizens to decide <laughs> uh, on the fate of Israel. Uh, and but but I was partly agreeing with her. I could understand the rage. I could understand the frustration because, you know, in a way, the, the I, I'm, I'm not going to 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 repeat cliches because we we don't have much time. But but for me, uh, yeah time. yeah. But this is this is the, the responsibility of being in hybrid identity of yeah. having this hyphen kind of uh, perspective. You identify and you contradict whatever is being yeah, said. Yeah, you have to always take the other side in a way. You cannot agree with anyone. So so yeah, uh, so so in a way for me the only way to process it, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I was I was I was hearing uh, about the bombard bombardments in Gaza when I was in France, but when I was talking to my family, they were they were just speaking about the missiles being shot at them. So for me, it wasn't it was kind of it it was it's it was horrific, and the only way I know to deal with nightmares is to start writing them down. So that's how it came to be so political. But my my intention wasn't uh, was all the time metaphysical. It wasn't about of the political course, state. As ever, no. as ever, as, as, as ever. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's another character in that same book, uh, a literary agent, an American, or is she English, literary agent, that yeah. says, oh, you uh, Sephardic Jews, you bitch about being discriminated. She's British. She's British okay. and, and that's just to, so that you don't pay heed to the pa suffering of the Palestinians. Yeah. Uh, and and she says that, and then you 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 draw a very interesting uh, parallel. She, and she says it's as if a Scandinavian worker was complaining to an Eritrean refugee about the five percent cut wage cut. <laughs> and you know, there, there, Ouch, is, right. there, there is kind of a trap which is kind of has to do with with the scales of suffering, mm -hmm. because when you when first you know the. Um, um, if we are going back to the sages of the Mishnah, they say the poor of your house are, are first. They, they are first in line, and then the poor of your city and the poor of other countries. So you have to attend to to the poorest of your house, of the, the right. people that lives near you, and uh, and it's it's interesting because when you widen the the scope of, mm -hmm. and then you see people that suffer more than you, and you ask, start to ask about the the legit, legitimacy of your own suffering. But in in Israel, it's uh, it's complicated, uh, much more complicated than that, because for people that came from Arab country, which called Sephardic sometimes, or, or Mizrahi, I don't know what, what's, the, what's the correct term right now, 
they are supposed, in order to be part of the privileged uh, uh, population within Israel, they have to cooperate with the oppression. So in a way, they are fighting oppression, but they don't have any solidarity with other people being oppressed, because the, the, the only way to get out of their own state of being oppressed is to uh, comply with the state of mm. with oppression of, oppression of other other populations and it's it's and, and i was trying to convey this wow yeah. okay I, 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 might, I might return us to the beginning of the conversation is that uh, us mizrahi jews israelis to born in israel to families coming from arab countries we don't ha with but with muslim, muslim countries, countries we don't have the privilege <laughs> we're not Arab countries. <laughs> this is an Arab country? Well, no, well, Iran. ours are, or Iran Arab is Arab or Muslim. Okay, no, I, I was Muslim referring countries. to your three passports. This yeah. was where I was non, aiming non -European to. Non-European countries. No, that we don't have the privilege to carry another passport except the Israeli passport unless we leave our uh, homeland. Uh, so if you can spare one, I would be... <laughs> I'm more than happy to cut it in two since... Because my know. friends, they do have German, Czech, Romanian, whatever, European mm -hmm. uh, 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 passports, except for the Israeli. And I have no way I could go to an Iranian embassy. Uh, there is no such in Israel, and there is few in, 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 in Europe, but uh, I, I won't be let in. Iranian, being a Jew, I, I am not welcomed in Iran. And so it's, it's a major thing that our homeland is truly our homeland, <laughs> and we don't have uh, uh, resonance or s some history that can uh, connect us to another ground except the one we walk on. So it's, uh, it's an issue. Maybe next time you meet this agent, the British agent, maybe you should... Uh, <laughs> it's a fictional character. It's a fictional character. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, Leela, you're uh, exiles, immigrants. You're also uh, involved with um, some foundations that deal with uh, refugees, current refugee crises in, in Europe. How does that pertain to your experience as, as a refugee? Well, I, I sit work? on the board of overseers of an organization called the International Rescue Committee, which was actually, it was an idea of coming from Einstein uh, to help Jewish uh, artists and intellectuals get out of Europe in the 30s. And now it's become a huge organization. I was very honored that they asked me to be on their board. And they op actually operate all around the world and they help uh, refugees in political crises and in, uh, in environmental crises. Just one little thing about Iran is that, um, and this is n really not at all in, in, in defense of Iran today, but, but one fact that is very, uh, that is not well known is that Iran still has 25,000 um, Jewish people living there, uh, and they are, it is the largest Jewish community outside of Israel in the Middle East. And we have two uh, dep Iranian deputies in parliament, uh, Jewish Iranian deputies uh, sitting in parliament. I'm sure they can't. I'm sure that it's symbolic, and you know, of it, it's of course not. Not it. it I mean, I, I would rather steer clear of any political comments. But but it's interesting that it exists. And I, what I know of my Jewish Iranian friends before the revolution is that uh, one lady called Roya Hakai once wrote an essay in a small uh, book that I had curated and she said that before the revolution they felt so at home in Iran uh, that during the Pesach prayer they would say next year in Tehran uh, because they belong <laughs> and they uh, and they wanted to stay so um, so and re regarding refugees yes of course I am part of that organization because it's a plight that I understand especially having been stateless for 15 years it was very difficult to get visas I, we had documents that meant nothing um, I also I, tr I it was it's a, we don't have time for this anecdote, but I, we tried, I tried to get an Iranian passport and my mother had to claim that I was slightly retarded and could not read Persian. <laughs> I mean, it, we, we have so many, you know, uh, there, there are so many adventures and misadventures uh, of, 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 uh, of the, the exile, the paperless, the stateless and so on. That's why now I feel I, I need to collect them just to reassure myself that should one country explode, I st still may have documents of, from another. Uh, but, but yes, um, so... Uh, Look, it's a it's a complicated world. I don't feel we're doomed. I don't feel we're doomed. I'm I'm uh, I I it's it's 
I always try to steer, steer clear from political comments, but it is a very political environment here, uh, of course, and it's impossible to, to pretend it doesn't exist. Um, I love your country, that's why I'm here. I've always loved it. Uh, I was in Hebron yesterday with a group called uh, Breaking the Silence, and uh, a, a young man from Tahal, uh, who was a former uh, IDF soldier, was there and talking about what his, his own experiences very, very honestly. And it was very, it was disturbing for me because I've always felt very, very connected to this land for reasons I can't quite even explain, um, or I may, maybe I could, but uh, but um, but 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 it was a difficult, very intense day, and he explained his experiences, what he had done, all his misgivings, the situations, things that I actually I didn't know, and um, and I it, it made me think very hard, but then what was most I thought this morning when I woke up, I thought what was extraordinary about this young man, Yehuda, was that he loves his country. He wasn't, he wasn't, he, he was doing all this and taking all of us there because he loves his country and he wants a better country. And he believes that it's possible. It's difficult, it's very difficult, but he loves his country. And that's the country that I, I want to believe in as well, you know. Yes, we all. Okay. Um. Okay, uh, so I want to wrap up with an identical question to all of you. Uh, as you uh, may remember from The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy had a pair of magical sh red shoes, which she had to click three times to get home. <laughs> um, she she <laughs> no, you go first. I think you go first. Okay, click. Dorit, you imagine you're clicking your red shoes three times. Where are you? You can close your eyes and ima imagine it. And then tell me where you are. It's a, it's a, it's a current uh, place. It can be anywhere <laughs> you get to. You can also travel within time. <laughs> you travel in time. My, my I'm sorry. My, my, the, the intuition brought a uh, rude thought to my mind. Rude. Go ahead with your <laughs> rude. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> Forget it. Let's travel in time. Rude or root? Root. <laughs> Why rude? rude. She's thinking uh, th no, that's no, where her red where, shoes where brought her. Be, where do you want to be? In a, in a s the sweetest place you want to be in. You start. Okay, Shimon, you're, you're a go. <laughs> where, where are you? No, it's, it's also, uh, it's and not it's a... Also it's rude? Not, no, no, it's not rude. It's, it's um, as I said, it's not a place but a moment in time. And I probably would like to be either at the moment when everything came into be or after everything is Finished. already gone. Wow. wow. This is an author's answer, you see? This uh, is how authors should, should answer. Lila? Um, I, I guess my, my answer is completely silly, but, I, but I, the reason why I feel we're not doomed is, and, and I, I appreciated your comment about liveliness so much, is that I feel there is a part, there is a part of, um, of of me that transcends always the complications and the pains because there's a part of me that's always uh, deeply optimistic and 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 very alive, and um, so I I have the silliest of answers. I'm just really happy to be here. <laughs> you know? wow, that's so I take it. I take it. Thank, I, you, thank you very much. much. Thank just you very much. Another passport. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> By the way, any diplomats around here? I, I, I'll I'll take uh, a, I'll take another passport. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for all of thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shlomzion Kainan.